hppodcraft.com. <laughs> This week's episode of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast is once again brought to you by Miskatonic Books. Miskatonic Books carries a large collection of mythos-related titles from the genre's best authors and publishers, both past and present. And don't forget, Miskatonic is always looking to buy, sell, and trade mythos-related books and ephemera. I was just looking at a listing for a signed uh, handwritten postcard by H.P. Lovecraft to Clark Ashton Smith, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And right now, until February 15th, Miskatonic Books is offering 10% off to our listeners. Just use the coupon code HPLP, that's HPLP, or HP Lovecraft Podcast, and you will receive 10% off your order. Sounds good. And I should also mention that Thursday nights are no longer ladies' nights at Miskatonic Books. There was a terrible accident, and uh, we're all very sorry. Yeah. Just, just, um, just remember the coupon code is 10% <laughs> off with uh, HPLP, HPLP, right now at MiskatonicBooks.com. And now on to tonight's episode of the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Derby had been married more than three years on that August day when I got the telegram from Maine. I had not seen him for two months, but had heard he was away on business. Azeneth was supposed to be with him, though watchful gossips declared there was someone upstairs in the house behind the doubly curtained windows. They had watched the purchases made by the servants. And now, the town marshal of Chessencook had wired of the draggled madman who stumbled out of the woods with delirious ravings and screamed to me for protection. It was Edward, and he had been just able to recall his own name, and my name, and address. That was the opening paragraph of chapter four of The Thing on the Doorstep, which we are concluding our coverage of in this, our 100th episode. Yeah! Fireworks just went off in my pants. Wow. It hurt a little bit, but it was very festive. (laughs) We've done a hundred episodes of this show. That's crazy. I don't even believe that that's true. It doesn't seem like we've been doing it that yeah. long, but I guess we have. Yeah, they stack up. And that doesn't include our readings that we've done either. It's a lot of audio. Yeah. Well, I would like to thank our listeners for enjoying our show and, and donating and doing all the things that they do to help us keep going. Because without you guys, we wouldn't be doing this. It's been a great hundred half hours of audio. <laughs> yeah. And I really enjoyed it, and, and thanks, everybody, for uh, continuing to stick with us. Please keep listening, and um, we're going to finish up Lovecraft, and then as we finish Lovecraft, we're going to talk about what we're going to do next. Hey, you know what? Also, we rarely call this out on the show, but you should check out our Facebook page and our Twitter account, because we do lots of chatting and goofy stuff on there as well. I was modeling some of our t-shirts this week. Yeah, yeah. Facebook, there's a lot of pictures and multimedia stuff, so if you want to check it out there. And that's uh, Facebook forward slash... HP Podcraft. HP Podcraft, great. Quickly, to synopsize what we covered last week, we've got these two characters, Edward Derby and Daniel Upton, and uh, they've been friends for a while. Edward has recently uh, gotten hooked up with this girl, gotten married. She's got protuberant eyes and uh, is into the black arts. Seems to be controlling his mind and making his life difficult. Our, Our protagonist, our narrator, Dan, is worried and is trying to figure out what's going on. That paragraph that you heard at the beginning of the story... Uh, it takes place about three years where we left off, and Edward sort of had some breakdown up in Maine and has called our narrator to mm-hmm. come and get him. So, yeah, that's where we are right now. He's out there in the woods by Chesson Cook. I think Thoreau wrote about that area uh, for the Atlantic Monthly. And stuff. I think he oh. was, you know, that was out where he was being all peaceful and stuff. By the way, uh, thanks to our reader once again, Fred Cross, for doing that. Yeah, thanks, Fred. He had a very mellifluous voice that puts mm-hmm. me at ease. Although I shouldn't be at ease because this is some terrible, crazy stuff that's happening. Yep. Dan drives out there to pick him up, and he's just in a real state. I think but they've got him boarded up at some, uh, he's at a cell at a town farm. <laughs> 
yeah. vacillating between frenzy and apathy. So he picks him up, and, and he's just ranting about uh, the pit of the Shoggoths down the 6,000 steps. He talks about Shibnagurath and the hooded thing. There was some kind of hooded thing um, running some kind of cult ritual or something out in the woods, and it was bleeding Kamog, Kamog, which was Ephraim Waite's secret name Yeah, in, in his old coven. So he was talking to him as if he was... He was there. He said he saw Shoggoth with changed shape. And then he says, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her with my own hands for doing this to me. Yeah. And this is, a, this is on the car ride back. Now, at some point, there's a crazy change that happens to him, right? Yeah. So he's freaking out he, and just saying all these things. And then he just kind of gets really quiet and says, mm-hmm. oh, what was I saying before? Oh, that was <laughs> that was nothing. I was, I'm was i being silly. I'm troubled by these delusions lately. Oh, well. Yeah. And then he takes the wheel of the car and he drives the rest of the way back <laughs> uh, to Arkham. It's so clear what's happening. And it reminds me of uh, The Whisper in Darkness a little bit, too. You know how in The Whisper in Darkness he suddenly changes personalities and he's like, oh, you know what? All those things I was talking about, the aliens, it's no big deal. They're friendly. I like them. You know, bring all of your collateral, all the things I've been sending you out here. Yeah, all the evidence. All records, that the, all the evidence in the records that this has ever happened. And this is the same kind of thing where he just suddenly says, you know what? I, I've just been working too hard. <laughs> but before he does have that personality switch, he talks a lot about this is happening to him quite a bit where she will take possession of his body, lock him upstairs in her body, and mm-hmm. then go out to these far-flung horrible places and do cult rituals and that kind of thing and he just sort of wakes up in the middle of it it's almost like a werewolf story yeah or like my movie where dad you know my movie where dad i've i've heard i've heard about well, i've seen a poster for where dad yeah. i haven't actually that's all I've, I've seen well it's a guy who's uh his dad this was a vehicle i wrote for rodney dangerfield but unfortunately he passed away but it would have yeah. been a good rodney dangerfield movie where he his son he passes away and then his son on the full moon turns into dangerfield so he wakes up you know in the morning in a hot tub with a bunch of you know bikini tops Scattered around, horrified at whatever oh, yeah. oh, hijinks he's gotten up to. I thought you ha- were thinking of Ralph Macchio for the. I was thinking of Ralph sun. Macchio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he would be perfect. Well, the the poster for the movie is in Scream Three. So. Yeah, if you happen to see Scream Scream Three, yeah, and and the feature uh, the poster actually features the face of Andrew Lehman and his father. That's right. <laughs> so if anybody has got a copy of Scream Three. They're walking up the stairs. There's a poster on the wall, and one of the characters says, Weird Dad, I love that movie. Right. (laughs) That's this. I'll put a link. It's totally off topic. I'll put a link up to it in our show notes. I think that Andrew's got the clip on his site somewhere. But anyway, so so he clearly gets possessed again or or taken over once again on the ride home. There's a couple of other clues he drops here about, I think it's about Azanath's... uh, handwriting yes well he says do you know my why my wife always takes such pains with that silly back handwriting have you ever seen a manuscript of old ephraim's you want to know why i shivered when i saw some hasty notes that she jotted down meaning when she's not she, she's yes. inventing a style of handwriting but when she's not being self-conscious about it she's got the same handwriting as Ephraim. because because she is Ephraim. <laughs> she's Ephraim. and it makes me so sad for asnath when they reveal that here the way he talks about it he says what devilish exchange was perpetrated in the house of horror where that blasphemous monster had his trusting weak-willed half-human child at his mercy yeah. it's pretty horrible when you think that this poor little girl you know up till this point in the story you think of Asnath as this kind of malevolent force yeah and here when you realize what he did to her i mean it really is kind of like a rape thing you know i mean he had her locked up in his house and he he entered her you know i would say it's even worse than rape they say when ephraim died he was a raving lunatic he was screaming and freaking out and saying these crazy yeah. things and that's because it was azanath in his body yeah she doesn't even exist at all anymore i mean she's no. just dead she's dead it's so awful which is also horrible about it is ed has been with ephraim pretending to be azanath the whole time Mm-hmm. This woman that he was in love with isn't one wasn't <laughs> wasn't even a woman and no. wasn't in love with him and just manipulated it and controlled him. And that is super sad as well. And, you know, they consummated their marriage, right? I mean, they were married. So, like, right. he's been sleeping with this old wizard. <laughs> oh, God. It's, it's really terrible. Yeah. In this drive, he takes over the wheel and says, you know, I hope you forget my attack back there. And they drive back. And Of course, it makes Dan feel pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. Now, after that, um, we get into chapter five. People, there's a lot of rumors about seeing him more and more in that kind of energized state, running around town, getting books. Oh, there's a part where he says they hinted at a meeting with a notorious cult leader lately expelled from England who had established headquarters in New York. Do you have any idea who that might be? I think they're referring to Aleister Crowley. Supposedly in that there's a Necronomicon book, uh, Colin Lowe wrote a Necronomicon. Mm-hmm. Well, like a version of the Necronomicon that got published. And he said that there was a connection between Sonia Green and Alistair Crowley. But that's completely fictional. I just imagine that Lovecraft would think he was an idiot. Oh, yeah. 
I think he was an idiot. I mean, <laughs> and, and Lovecraft was far more uh, hard on these kind of people than I was. Yeah. I would, well, so. he wasn't, I wouldn't say he was an idiot as much as he was a dude that n- knew how to get chicks to have sex with him. Well, he's a huckster. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was, I was, I was, he was very smart. <laughs> I just, people kind of have this reverence for Aleister Crowley and I don't understand it. Well, he knew how to nail chicks, dude. All right. <laughs> you don't need a cult for that, do you? You don't need one, but it helps. People are hearing sobbing in the Crown and Shield house, and yeah. it seems to be a woman's, although, uh, and people think it's Asenath if they're crying, although some people think that maybe it's a guy sometimes. Yeah. Although there's a great scene where it says, one day this was all dispelled when Asenath appeared on the streets and chatted in a sprightly way with a large number of acquaintances, apologizing for her recent absences and saying she had hysteria, some kind of nervous breakdown. Or they were hearing a guest from Boston. It was crazy. That's what yeah. it was. Well, there was one thing, too, where um, Ed comes over for a visit to pick up some books from Dan, but mm-hmm. he doesn't use the knock. Right. He doesn't do the knock, and it, the behavior is weird, and he he's pretty sure it's actually Ephraim in, in his body. Dan's on board now at this point. He's starting to believe these things. And then there's the break, right? Dan shows up and says, it's over. Yeah. Uh, Asnath is gone. We had a long talk. While the servants were gone, I, I said, you got to stop preying on me. You got to stop invading my body. And he says, I had certain occult defenses that I never told you about. Because he was a, a cultist in his own right. He was able to find right. some kind of way to stop her from taking over his body. And he's just gotten rid of her. Right. Well, that's what he's saying. And he's just really manic about it. He's drinking whiskey at Dan's place and saying, yeah, I, I paid the servants off. I didn't like the way they laughed when they walked away, but they're gone now, too. Uh, you probably think I'm crazy, but when I was in... Oh, even any cops do it. He says, when I when you picked me up and I was driving, she entered my body. He says, that praying wolf in my body, which I thought was great writing. Yeah. You ought to have known the difference. I, it's funny when he yells at him. You should have known that it was different. He's like, I did know. Then why didn't you do anything? You know, why did you let me drive? <laughs> but what, what could you do? I mean, and that is, I mean, if you started acting yeah. like somebody... I mean, if I said, oh, no, somebody's possessed Chad Spifer's body, yeah. nobody's going to buy that. The important thing is he had to get rid of her... He had to break up with her. He's hoping she goes out west for a divorce. Mm-hmm. He had to do this before Halloween. She was going to make a sacrifice. Where, yeah, they were going to do a sacrifice, and then she would have had his body. Permanently. Forever, the way that Ephraim did. I mean, he says, you, you must know what I hinted in the car, that she isn't Azneth at all, but really old Ephraim himself. Uh, this, I reflected, was a case for the asylum, but I would not be the one to send him there. <laughs> Upon reflection, yes, this is a case for the asylum. <laughs> There's this good, it's a good section here when he's talking to him. He says... Uh, I'll tell you something of the forbidden horrors she led me into, something of the age-old horrors that are even now festering in out-of-the-way corners with a few monstrous priests to keep them alive. The nice thing about the story is that it's mostly a character study. I think Lovecraft himself said that, that this was a little different than most of his work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because of that, he doesn't go too over the top with this stuff. Yeah. And so when it's suggested in here, I think it really has, it's to good effect. Yeah, I like it. Because it just, it doesn't really tell you anything that's going on, but it really hints at this much larger conspiracy you know of these yeah. cults and these these things that exist outside of it and it's just you know it's it's lovecraft stuff it's good mythos yeah well, it's wonderful dan is thinking once my son gets out of harvard this summer we're going to go on a vacation and go to europe and we probably should take edward with us right. he's clearly been under a strain and they're they're re uh, his old derby house is they're they're working on it trying to get it fixed up so he can right. move out of the crown and shield place that he was living in with asnath you know ed's also a little worried that there are that these cults they might come after him oh right because he knows things that he shouldn't know and he's sending checks to those servants so it's like he's being blackmailed or something like that yeah as well so he's still in a bad place but the thing is he's not moving out of the crown and shield place no as much as it seems like he should, he's still... He's still staying there. Why? Why is he staying there? Well, we get a better picture of it when we get into Chapter 6. Around Christmas, Derby shows up. He's lost his mind. I mean, he's really having a hard time. Yeah, he goes crazy. He's like, my brain, my brain, Dan, it's tugging from beyond, knocking, clawing that she-devil. Ephraim, yeah. Kamog, Kamog. The Shoggoths. With the Kamog thing. Is it possible that maybe even Ephraim isn't Ephraim? It is possible. It just occurred to me when I was reading it this time that maybe it's a really old, maybe Ephraim was even taken over. Could be. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe. I mean, they say that he found in the Necronomicon the way to do this. So it yeah. probably is Ephraim. Yeah. And I know a lot of times they have those secret names in cults and things like that, like people's true names. I've heard that in mysticism where right. they'll have a special name that has power and not their normal name. Yeah. And if somebody knows that name, they have power over you. Yeah, exactly. As usual, um, when Edward comes over and he's freaking out, Dan gets him to drink. <laughs> <laughs> this time he pours some wine down his throat. Last time it was whiskey, but that's always what they, how they confront this. Yes. Well, as that's trying to uh, try to take him over again, um, and he stayed at Dan's that night. Yeah, she's trying again. Uh, 
And he says, nothing can stop that force, not distance, nor magic, nor death. It comes and comes mostly in the night. Oh, Dan, if only you knew as I do how horrible it is. Oh. And then he stays the night, but yeah. then he splits in the morning, right? Well, he gets up and he's gone. Um, yeah. Dan gets up and the, the, he's just not there anymore. And he went to he goes to pieces really rapidly. After yeah, that. he really starts falling apart. Uh, he doesn't come back to Dan's, but they go by there and he's just sitting in his library staring at nothing and just listening, mm-hmm. listening, and listening. Sometimes he's able to talk rationally, but more than he's having seizures at night mm-hmm. and, and, re, and he's really frenzied. And so Dan... You know, he doesn't want to do this, but he... He keeps saying things like, I had to do it. I had to do it. It'll get me. It'll get me. Down in the dark. Right. But they, they institutionalize him. He has a discussion with his doctor, his banker, and his lawyer, and they decide, let's put him in the Arkham Sanitarium. Now, we know that he's going to have his, bla- his brains blown out there. Right. Kind of his uh, final resting place. And then Dan takes over his business. He's dealing with the Crown and Shield place and mm-hmm. all of the stuff that's in there. All kinds of utterly inexplicable objects. I could not decide what to do with them. So he leaves it, you know, untouched mostly, but he's basically taken care of. Edward's affairs for him. And then the sanitarium gets a hold of him and says, oh, uh, you know, he's better. He's out of this thing. He seems to be well, but he's lost some of his memory. It's like, hmm. And, and, and Dan's pretty encouraged by that. But when he shows up, he says, no, nah, this isn't him. It's definitely as an ath slash Ephraim. And it's similar to Charles Dexter Ward, isn't it? Now, this is yeah. This is one of those things where people go, "Oh my God, this is just like Charles Dexter Ward." There's a guy in there who's not really who it is, and yeah, and I yeah, you're right. It it is very similar, but a little different. Yeah, it's a lot different. I mean, he's a it's a man inside of a woman inside of a man. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's, different. it's different. Yeah, but obviously he's t- he's speaking very uh, coherently, and and he's not raving anymore. And the staff is saying, you know what, we're going to start making arrangements for his le- his release, maybe within the week. Yeah. I mean, what are we going to do? Even though he's got some gap in his memory, he's, he's being pretty reasonable. Uh-huh. Dan beats a retreat and doesn't really know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. He's like, well, if Ephraim is in his body, then where is Edward? Where whose body is he in? Where's he at? Right. And that gets us into the seventh chapter. It was in the night after that second evening that Stark. Utter horror burst over me and weighted my spirit with a black, clutching panic from which it can never shake free. It began with a telephone call, just before midnight. I was the only one up, and sleepily took down the receiver in the library. No one seemed to be on the wire, and I was about to hang up and go to bed when my ear caught a very faint suspicion of sound at the other end. Was someone trying under great difficulties to talk? As I listened, I thought I heard a sort of half-liquid bubbling noise. Glub. 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 Which had an odd suggestion of inarticulate, unintelligible word and syllable divisions. I called, Who is it? But the only answer was, Glub, glub. Glub, glub. I could only assume that the noise was mechanical, But fancying that it might be a case of a broken instrument able to receive but not to send, I added, I can't hear you. Better hang up and try information. Immediately, I heard the receiver go on the hook at the other end. That is the creepiest use of Glub Glub ever. Oh, uh, yeah. It is, absolutely, because Glub Glub's kind of funny to me. <laughs> yeah, but it's, oh, gosh. Who made that call? It's pretty horrific. When it was traced afterward, they found it came from the old Crown and Shield house. Mm-hmm. Someone or something called him from there. Now, at this point, Dan says he believes everything that Edward told him. He, he believes every, everything. It's all real, Azanath, Ephraim in the body, all that stuff happened. And he's going to explain why. You know, he says that afterwards people said, you know, they went to the Crown and Shield place and there, there was a remote cellar storeroom that was all in upheaval. There were tracks in the dirt. The wardrobe was hastily rifled through. Weird marks on the telephone, clumsily used stationery and a detestable stench everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the authorities are thinking this is some kind of revenge from the servants. Right. They went further and got revenge on him because he was Edward's best friend. After that call and after what happens, he, he says, I went up the next day. I went to the madhouse and I shot. Dead shot dead. Him. Yeah. yeah, and and said that you must cremate his body afterwards. That's right. But what what was the thing that happened that caused him to do that? I mean, what there are people he's hinting at it here in these first few paragraphs. Where he's saying yeah. there are tales of that dwarf grotesque malodorous thing met by at least three wayfarers in High Street just before two o'clock. Well, he gets a knock at two o'clock in the morning, and the knock is Edward's knock. The three yeah. followed by the two. He gets up. He goes to the door. He's first just hit with this 
terrible smell. This, what is it says? A gust of insufferably fetid wind. It's this terrible, gross smell, horrible thing. And then he saw a dwarfed, humped figure on the steps. Yes, this is the thing on the doorstep. This is the thing on the doorstep. It's this weird figure. It's making those noises, right? The glub, glub kind of mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. And it's got on one of Edward's overcoats, the bottom almost touching the ground and the sleeves rolled back. It's still covering the hands. And this kind of, it, you know, it's so cute when a kid will put on like an adult coat or something like that. And that's oh. what it makes. It's like a perverted, weird, disgusting. <laughs> I need yeah. to think about this this little zombie thing, glub glubbing on the on the doorstep. In the and he, he passes out. Well, he gets the note. <laughs> the, thing hand, the thing on the doorstep hands him a note. As he's reading, that's when he passes out. I think he says, oh. uh, I fainted at the end of the third paragraph. <laughs> Oh, man, it's so funny. Well, this is what the note says that is handed to him by this awful thing on the doorstep. Dan, go to the sanitarium and kill it. Exterminate it. It isn't Edward Derby anymore. She got me. It's Asenath. And she has been dead three months and a half. I lied when I said she had gone away. I killed her. I had to. It was sudden, but we were alone, and I was in my right body. I saw a candlestick and smashed her head in. She would have got me for good at Hallamass. I buried her in the farther cellar storeroom under some old boxes and cleaned up all of the traces. The servants suspected next morning, but they have such secrets that they dare not tell the police. I sent them off, but God knows what they and others of the cult will do. I thought for a while I was all right, and then I felt the tugging at my brain. I knew what it was. I ought to have remembered. A soul like hers, or Ephraim's, is half detached and keeps right on after death as long as the body lasts. She was getting me, making me change bodies with her, seizing my body and putting me in that corpse of hers buried in the cellar. I knew what was coming. That's why I snapped and had to go to the asylum. Then it came. I found myself choked in the dark, in Asenath's rotting carcass down there in the cellar under the boxes where I put it, and I knew she must be in my body at the sanitarium. Permanently, for it was after Hallowmass, and the sacrifice would work even without her being there, sane and ready for the release as a menace to the world. I was desperate, and in spite of everything, I clawed my way out. I'm too far gone to talk. I couldn't manage to telephone, but I can still write. I'll get fixed up somehow and bring you this last word and warning. Kill that fiend if you value the peace and comfort the world. See that it is cremated. If you don't, it will live on and on, body to body forever, and I can't tell you what it will do. Keep clear of black magic, Dan. It's the devil's business. Goodbye. You've been a great friend. Tell the police whatever they'll believe, and I'm damnable sorry to drag all this on you. I'll be at peace before long. This thing won't hold together much more. Hope you can read this. And kill that thing. Kill it. Yours, Ed. Wow. Man. The fact that he is being, his consciousness is being transferred into a corpse that's walled up in the basement is... That's pretty horrific. Really the crowning touch of horror uh, on the whole story to me. Absolutely. I still remember reading this for the first time a long time ago, and that really hit me hard. It was just horrible. Uh. (laughs) What he sees and smells what's cluttered up in the threshold where the warm air had struck it. So basically this... This corpse that handed him the note just collapses into a discarded mass of corrupted flesh on the doorstep. Lequescent yeah. horror, I think he calls it. Uh, and some dental work positively identified the skull as Azanath. And that's how he ends the story. It's a good one. Yeah. I had some uh, Michael Reeves, who wrote some notes for us on the last that we read on the last uh, episode, had a couple of more thoughts about this, uh, which I have here. He writes, um, 
The best way to describe this story's structure is as a sort of head-on collision between Invasion of the Body Snatchers and a Moliere-style bedroom farce, only instead of climbing in and out of each other's beds, they're in and out of each other's bodies. <laughs> First, it's Ephraim kicking out his daughter Azanath's soul so he can take over the lease. Anybody else get an unhealthy whiff of metaphysical incest just now? Then Edward Derby gets the metaphysical boot from his wife, who's really at least part of the time his father-in-law. Can I get a ooh? <laughs> He's got a couple of those from us. And then he goes on to say this. Michael writes, I have this theory about Lovecraft. I think that just as the golden age of comics wasn't the 40s, the 50s, or the 60s, it was 12. So too is there a certain window of opportunity during which, if you're exposed to HBL, you totally get it. I think in my case I was 14. If you miss that window, you're forever doomed to wonder with vague irritation what all the fuss is about with this strange guy with the Easter Island profile <laughs> who's always describing moons as being gibbous. And what the hell does full glorious mean anyway? But don't worry, you'll get it soon enough. Just repeat after me. Yeah, yeah, Cthulhu Fitagan. See? It's as easy as falling off a non-Euclidean doorstep. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Michael, for those notes. I yeah, think that's a really good much. way to sum it up. Uh, you can find more about Michael's work on his blog and his Amazon page, which we'll link to again. He, he's right, though. I think from some of the interviews we've done, there's that window of time when you start reading this. And, and if you read it when you're you know, 13, 14, 15, around that age, yeah, you really get it. And you'll probably be a lifelong fan. And if you don't, it might be difficult. Although I know people are just starting now. I mean, we get letters from people who are just starting in their adulthood yeah. to read Lovecraft. And, and they like it, but... But there is that little pocket of time. I mean, of course, that's when I was ex- exposed to it. And I was maybe 14. Yeah, it, of course, it's stuck with me my whole life. And I'm doing 100 episodes of a podcast about it now. <laughs> I can't believe we've done 100 of these episodes. 100 episodes. You think we would have been in better form for this being our 100th episode? Now? Yeah, I know. <laughs> we were you both we pretty way scared. better at this. And we're still just kind of <laughs> rambling around. Yeah, muddling through. Well, what else do we know about the story? Any other notes? <laughs> and it was written August 21st. Uh, through the 24th in 1933. It was first published in Weird Tales, uh, January 1937. So this was published in January 37. He died in March, so this would have been one of the last things. That... Yeah, Lovecraft didn't care much for the story and just sort of sat on it. Uh, it wasn't until 36 when Julius Schwartz said that, hey, you should market some of this to England. And he goes, well, you know, maybe I will submit some stuff. So he decided to submit Haunter in the Dark and this story together to Farnsworth. Uh-huh. Right? Okay. And he accepted both of them. So those were the last things that Lovecraft submitted. Wow. The, you know, the closer we get to the end here, I'm getting more and more sad about the fact that he passed away. I mean, I know everybody's got to, but... Well, he was a young guy, and he really... And the way he died was just sort of sad. He just didn't take care of himself. He had malnutrition, and then it progressed into cancer, and he died. At least nobody uh, swapped souls with him. Or did they? Oh, no. <laughs> Lovecraft lives on. Actually... He would be the one that knows what page, because in the in the story thing on the doorstep, he says, I'm not going to tell you what page it's on. Yeah, but <laughs> he, he actually knows. says that. But Lovecraft would know. He knows. Oh, yeah. On Facebook, one of our listeners, Nick Palladino, wrote, you know, since Azanath is a deep one hybrid, eventually she would turn into a deep one. Right. And then be immortal and live forever in the bottom of the ocean. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So wouldn't Ephraim be all like, hey, great, I get to live forever in the bottom of the ocean as a deep one. Why switch bodies into a human, another human's body? Look, here's the, here's the problem. Even if she turns into a deep one and goes in the ocean, she's still a skirt. That's, I mean, the important thing yeah, is, yeah, exactly. he needs a male brain. He needs a male brain, absolutely. And I, I say, if you go to deep one town in the bottom of the mm-hmm. ocean, you probably have to do deep one things like clean off the algae and, yeah. you know, pick. He doesn't want to be doing that he, stuff. You don't want to do that stuff. And being able to swap bodies, you're immortal that way. So, yeah, you got a lot more freedom, I think. I'm surprised. He, yeah, I'm surprised he didn't make a move on a somebody rich and famous. Switch bodies with Valentino or something like that. Yeah, that would have been a way better move. But then again, if you want to keep a low profile to do your Colton, you don't want to. You don't want to rock that boat. <laughs> Ah, uh, you're a Colton. Well, thanks everybody for joining us on our hundredth episode, uh, and and uh, hopefully we haven't bored you too much. No, gosh, I don't think we 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 like this story a lot. I know a lot of people think it's a, sort of a, one of his weaker stories, but we can disagree. Yeah, and it sounds like a lot of other people agree with us. I mean, I'm getting a lot of notes from people saying, "Hey, I like this too." Almost like they're embarrassed to like it, but hey, it's a good story. <laughs> I really love it. It might even be in my top five Lovecraft stories. I mean, I, I really. Really very fond of it. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Michael Reeves once again for the notes and, and for corresponding with us and for writing that great Ghostbusters episode among uh, a million other great TV and film and, uh, and books and short stories yeah. and all the good stuff that he's done. We'll put up some links to Michael's stuff. Go check that out. Thanks to Fred Cross for being our reader. He did an excellent job. Really great glad job. to have him on the show. Yeah. Great job. And uh, once again, don't forget Miskatonic Books, uh, miskatonicbooks.com. You can get 10% off anything there. 
with the code HPLP. That's 10% off with the code HPLP at MiskatonicBooks.com. What do we have up next? Ah, we're doing a double feature. We are? And we haven't done that in a long time, yeah. The Evil Clergyman and The Horror in the Burying Ground. They're both very short. Oh, okay, great. But it's been a long time since we've got to do a double feature. I'm really looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Wow, we're doing two stories? Yeah, I don't know much about either of them. Either. No, I've never read either of them. Yeah, I think they're collaboration. The Evil Clergyman is not a collaboration, but The Horror in the Burying Ground is with Hazel Hill. Ah, okay. We can expect that somebody will be turned to stone in The Horror in the Burying Ground. I hope so. <laughs> I want Yet some... the brain will be alive. <laughs> Chad, I want to say uh, good job on these last hundred episodes here. Yeah, you too, man. I've been I've been really happy with your work. I right, thank you. <laughs> Did I get the job? You've got the job. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to thank all of our listeners for uh, supporting us and making the show what it is. Because without you guys, there wouldn't be a show. Yeah, that's right. And we'll be back uh, next time with episode one hundred and one. And with that, I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And this has been the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcast.com hppodcraft.com 